as the second millennia BCE came to a close, we have the rise of a new poetic tradition. Now we've looked at Sumerian and Egyptian poetry, which goes back to the third millennia BC at least. Uh, last time we looked at Indian poetry in the Vedas, uh, which uh, the earliest documents we have from there are probably around the mid-second millennium. But before we get to the early first millennium BCE and see the rise of Greek poetry, we have another poetic tradition that makes its mark on history. This is the Chinese poetic tradition. It's in the Zhou dynasty, uh, Z-H-O-U, we spell it in English, that we start to get a poetic tradition coming out of China. This begins probably sometime in the 1100s BCE, um, and we have a collection of poems, which is sort of the founding text of Chinese poetry, uh, that gathers poetry from that 12th century BC all the way up to the 7th century BC. And I want to share with you some of these early poems in Chinese. Like the Vedas, the early Chinese poems have a little more attention to structure of syllables and structure of stanzas than we saw in Egyptian or in Sumerian. So in these early poems, which are collected into a text that's called uh, the Shi Qing or the Shi Jing, which just means something like the book of poems or the book of songs. Uh, in these poems, we find a poetic tradition that has some, some parallels with the Indian, the Sumerian, and the uh, Egyptian, uh, but also some new things emerging. One of the things that emerges in the Book of Songs uh, that's very lovely and I think surprising is we get some just very straightforward love poems. And I want to share one of those with you today. So this is from the section of the Book of Songs um, that collects, uh, collects songs from uh, the area called Chen. Now, the, the sort of legend about the Book of Songs was that uh, in the Zhu Dynasty, there was an emperor or a leader who decided he wanted to collect all the songs from the known world that he governed. And so he sent out his ministers to this province and that province, and they gathered up, you know, what are the folk songs people are singing? What are the, you know, uh, poems that are complaining about bad ministers? <laughs> um, and so you have, you have a range of poems uh, from around China uh, from this era, and probably poems that span this about 500-year period from the 1100s uh, into the 700s and 600s. Um, but some of the most striking of these are these poems that are just simple expressions of human longing and love. I, I want to read one to you. Um, this is called something like um, The Bright Moon or The White Moon. Um, this translation that I'm going to read to you uh, is from the 20th century, and uh, it titles it White Moonrise. The white rising moon is your bright beauty, binding me in spells till my heart's devoured. The light moon soars, resplendent like my lady, binding me in light chains till my heart's devoured. Moon in white glory, you are the beautiful one who delicately wounds me till my heart's devoured. It's a short poem. You can see that formally uh, there's this repeating structure both in the first line and the last line of these four-line stanzas. So it's three four-line stanzas, and each begins with a line about the moon and ends with this refrain, till my heart's devoured. Uh, it's a sad poem, um, but it's also not just, a, not just a poem of despair, it's a poem of longing, right? The, the heart is bound in spells until it's devoured by the beauty of this beloved one. One of the other characteristics of this poem that I find really fascinating as someone who's interested in meter and line structure is that each of the lines of this poem is exactly four words long. If you look at the Chinese characters, there are four Chinese characters per line. The white rising moon is your bright beauty binding me in spells till hearts devoured. Now the translator here, you know, puts in, you know, that my hearts devoured. Um, th there's, a there's a little bit of um, adjustment that we need to do in English translation uh, to clarify some of these um, single word and even single syllable characters 
that would make sense in Chinese, but we need a little bit more syllables in English to communicate it. But I think that the translator here has done a good job in these first couple lines, the white rising moon. Just four words that correspond to the four characters that we get in Chinese. And I think that it's interesting that, you know, we've been looking a lot at a lot of poetry that's um, very lofty. It's calling upon the divine. It's calling upon the gods to aid men in their struggles. This doesn't have a explicitly religious element. And yet it has this interesting um, kind of interest in the heavens. It's the moon that shines on this scene of the lovers. And also the moon reminds the lover of the beloved. The white rising moon is your beauty. Um, it's this sort of classic, you know, the, the stars are in your eyes, honey. Um, it's, it's, the, uh, it's the 12th century BC version of that. And we're going to see as poetry progresses that this interest, not just in um, long and short vowel sounds, which you don't quite have in Chinese in the same way that you do in, uh, in Sanskrit, um, but this interest in counting very precisely the number of syllables and the number of words in each line and limiting oneself to this frame of we have four lines of four words each. Um, and that's what we're going to build our song of longing out of. These constraints, just like they do today, these constraints thousands of years ago are seen by poets not as something that are you know harsh in their vibe, uh, something that's holding them back from expression. But these constraints of just four words per line and just four lines per stanza are what create the conditions that allow a poet to write something like, moon in white glory, you are the beautiful one who delicately wounds me. The, this economy of language that's created by the formal structure creates this ringing and resonant creation that echoes down the ages to us and maybe, you know, hits us where we're at or where we've been sometime in life. Next time I want to look at how the Greek tradition is picking up on this interest in syllables and also this interest in love poetry. Thanks.